again chose to join us uh, let us pray most heavenly and gracious father once again we come asking that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your fresh father we thank you for all that you've done we thank you for what you're going to do and father we love you and we praise you in Jesus name amen so we are, of course are still on article number 11 uh, the perseverance of saints and our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure unto the end, that the persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And so we're going to start off by reading John the third chapter, verses verse 16 out of the King James for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life so we are continuing to look at the amazing view of the father's love for mankind and answering the question why why was it all necessary why did Jesus have to die for our sin? God in the garden gave hope that one day a redeemer would be the seed of the woman. And then he worked uh, through 42 generations to bring that plan into fruition. But when, the, when he entered in the earth, he entered as a baby born just like every other person that has entered the earth so after waiting 42 generations then when he arrives he is a baby babies are helpless they need protection in fact babies are probably the neediest of the species and so Jesus' first years of life are spent hiding from an earthly king that desired to kill him. So after 42 generations of waiting for a redeemer, humanity had to wait another 30 years for Jesus' ministry on earth to begin. And so we're seeing that God works through time through time, through people, through places. But right about now, I've got another why. Okay, I hear you thinking, not another why. Well, this one won't take weeks or months to answer. In fact, it'll be answered shortly. Uh, but the why is, why such an elaborate plan? Why couldn't God just say, I forgive y'all and move on. I mean, isn't that what we do? We even teach our children to do it. We tell the person who we've offended, we, we say, I'm sorry, in hopes that they will forgive us and in hopes that the relationship is mended. So why couldn't we just say, God, I'm sorry, and that be enough? And Jesus not have to die. Why couldn't God just forgive Adam and Eve and start fresh in the garden? Or why couldn't God just turn them back into the dirt from which they came and make a new model, a new and improved model? It, it, it was just two people. No big deal, right? I mean, he's God. He could do whatever he wants right? Or if he had decided not to do that, then he could have waited and decided later on to make a move. I mean, when you think about it, there are all kinds of scenarios that could have played out, at least in my head. For instance, at the Tower of Babel, instead of just changing the language, he could have just wiped them out, destroyed everybody. Or 
when he sent the flood. He could have, again, wiped out the entire earth, including Noah and his family. And, and at both of these instances, sin was the problem. Sin is always the problem. Then there's the incident with the children of Israel in the desert. While Moses was up on the mountain with God, the folk got tired of waiting and decided to build a golden calf. As if that's not bad enough, they gave that thing that they had just built, they gave it credit for bringing them out of Egypt and delivering them from slavery. How crazy is that? When God had just delivered them in, in such a miraculous way. At that time, God threatened to wipe them out and just start over again with Moses. Once again, here I'm thinking God could have just wiped them out. Instead, God continued to deal with fallen humanity. So why couldn't God just forgive? and continue to deal with mankind instead of sending his son to die? The answer, see, you didn't have to wait weeks or months. The answer is because God is a righteous, justice God. And his righteousness is a natural expression of his holiness. He is infinitely pure, which means that he is opposed to all sin. Because of his righteousness, because of his justice, God cannot just overlook sin. Because we live in a, in a corrupt world, it's hard to, for us to understand pure justice. Pure justice says when there is a sin, somebody when, when somebody falls short, somebody has to pay. Pure justice doesn't just let people off the hook. We live in a world where the poor have to pay and the rich get off. But it's not, that's not how pure justice works. In, in a system of pure justice, sin is sin. There's no categories. No little sin, no common sin, no major sin. That's what we do. We assign degrees, degrees to sin. But pure justice has just one category, sin. And the punishment is always death. Nobody gets off the hook. Let's look at Romans, the third chapter, verses 21 through 26. And we're going to unpack it a verse at a time. So you have time to actually pick up your Bible. And, and then we can just go through the verses. All right, get your Bible. We're going to start with Romans, the third chapter, verse 21. And this is the NIV version, which reads, But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify, which the law and the prophets testify. So here, Paul in the book of Romans uses lots of transition words to link together different thoughts. And usually I am one for going back and looking at what is connecting, you know, looking for what the there is there for. And, and so, but in this instance, verses 21 starts with a transition word in the form of a conjunction to link verses 20 to verse 21. Then verse 20 starts with a therefore. And verse 19 starts with a now. So I, ho I hope you're seeing my point. We would probably end up, if, if we were looking for all the connections and all the why the therefores are there, we would probably end up going back to the first chapter and, and verse one. 
because Paul here is building a case to show that righteousness is received as a gift from God rather than by works of the law. So righteousness means a right standing with God. And Paul is saying in verse 21 that God has revealed a new way to have a righteous standing with him. And this new way is apart from the law. Remember under the Old Testament law, righteousness came by keeping a lot of rules, by doing stuff, by behaving. And, and, and you know, because there were all kinds of rules and rituals that had to be kept. And, and Paul is saying, now there's a new approach to God that does not require lots of rule keeping. Thank God for that, because I am not a good rule keeper. This new way, which is the gospel, does not require behaving properly. Now, I don't mean that you can wrong them up, but it, 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 in order to be saved does not require a bunch of doing. It requires believing. Instead of behaving, it requires believing. Note that Paul is not throwing out the law as useless because the law served its purpose. It reveals the righteousness of God. Paul says that the law is holy and is just and is good. The law testifies to God's righteousness, but the law couldn't do anything to help us. It just condemned us for breaking it. You either, you, you are either justified for obeying it or you're condemned for breaking it. And, and so the law could not issue us, could not help us to obey it. And verse 22, which we'll break into uh, A and a B, the verse 22, the A part says, and this is still the NIV, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So there's a new approach to God and it has nothing to do with performing. Now I know folk hate, some, some folk hate that because they are good performers. Remember Nicodemus and the Pharisees? They were good performers. If the truth be told, we have some good performers in our day and time. Folk that love to play religion. It's like, you know, when I was a kid and, and, and I used to love to play dress up. A lot of folk are still doing that. Performing for God. Uh, thinking that their performance makes them righteous. The great thing about this new way of achieving righteousness from God is that it has nothing to do with performance. And it has nothing, uh, it, it has to do with, it, it has, wait a minute, I'll get it right. And it has nothing to do with what I do. It, it's not through the law. It's a whole new way. It comes from God through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And the amazing thing is that it is to all that believe, to the Jews as well as the Gentiles. And then verse 22b and verse 23, and I'm sticking with the NIV version for all the verses. It says, there is no difference uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul says there is no difference. You don't have to be a good, you don't have to be good at keeping the rules in, in this new way of righteousness. Everybody gets in the same way. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, it doesn't matter. Everybody gets in the same way. Because when you think about it, just some people are just naturally better than other people. 
some some people good good goodness comes just natural. It's you know it's just what they do, but in this new system, none of that matters. We are all placed on level ground. We all have equal opportunity to get in. The reason? Because everybody has sinned. Doesn't matter what your brand of sin is, we all are on level grounds. No big U's and no little I's. All have sinned and all fall short of the mark. We, we could we could all start today where we are and if it were possible did nothing but good from this time forward and we would still miss the mark because somewhere in our past we sinned and, and for most of us we don't have to look too far in our past and no matter when or where or how you sin, it counts against you. Even if you didn't mean to, even if it was just one of those, oops, I didn't mean to do that. It doesn't matter. It counts against you. To not fall short, we would have to, first of all, not be conceived in sin. And, and then to not actually do sin. The fact that we are conceived in sin means that even if we could do everything right after birth, we could still, we would still fall short of the glory of God. And we would miss the mark. And no amount of good will make up for that. In, in essence, we're doomed just from the fact of being conceived. Verse 24 the NIV, it says, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So Paul is saying that we fall short of the glory of God. Now here is the amazing part. We are justified freely. In other words, we are made right with God freely. God has taken all of the performance out of the equation and has justified us freely. Meaning that he has just given it to us. It's free. It's a gift. We get to come before the throne of God freely. We don't have to wait to be summoned in or go through somebody else. Hebrews 4 and 16, in fact, urges us to come boldly before the throne of God. We have that privilege because of the free gift of God. Now we must read the remainder of the verse to see how we're given this free gift. It says, by his grace, through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. Now there are some terms here that we need to take note of. Grace and redemption. Grace doesn't depend on the recipient. Grace is God's unmerited favor, meaning there is nothing in us that deserves it. Grace is part of God's nature. Then, redemption. Redemption is the purchase back of something that has been lost by the payment of a ransom. So, we get the right standing with God. We are made righteous freely. And it came by Christ Jesus. We get a free gift. But... It costs somebody something. Wonder who could it be? Well, you've got to come back next time to find out. For now, that's all for today. Join us next time as we continue to explore on our scenic route just the amazing love that the Father has for us. 
And why? Why did Jesus have to die? Come back next time and we'll answer the question. Until then, goodbye. See you next time. Be safe. I love you.